Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. Hello again. Welcome to Hear Her Sports. I am your host and producer, Elizabeth Emery. It's 2022, and the first episode of the year deals with a topic I've been thinking about a lot lately, and expect to be for the rest of the year. It's also the topic that led to the launch of Hear Her Sports, and that is sports media coverage of female athletes. As you all know, only 4% of sports media coverage is about women. And to top that off, that coverage is not of the same quality as the men's coverage. For more details, take a listen to episode 71 with Cheryl Cookie to find out about the long-term study she's been doing on this topic for three decades. What is also rough for followers of women's sports is actually finding the coverage, which tends to be buried and hard to find. So this conversation with Mary Wittenberg, the president of the new League One Volleyball, or Love, is a great way to get going in 2022. Because we do talk about the media, and we talk about starting a new league in women's sports what it takes, what's been easy, where League One Volleyball is going, and what the future of women's sports looks like. I was struck by how new this project is and the deep planning going into it. It also shows that not all the steps are clear yet. How do we make a women's pro league work? The sponsors and the cities need to be involved and invested and interested. The media needs to be involved. One thing that cheers me about love is that the health and long-term health of the athletes are being considered. Mental health is a priority. Life after their athletic career is a priority. And finally, notice how top-level female athletes are interested in this project. One of the lessons I've learned producing Hear Her Sports for more than five years is that female athletes understand their place between history and a better future. So many women are putting in the work to create what they want to see in sport. So let's get going, and I'll introduce Mary. Mary Wittenberg is president of League One Volleyball, or Love, a new first-of-its-kind volleyball community. There's a network of junior clubs across the country and a developing professional women's volleyball league. Mary grew up in Buffalo, New York, the oldest of seven children in an athletic family. At Canisius College, she was a coxswain for the men's rowing team and an avid runner. She earned a law degree from Notre Dame University Law School, where she continued to run training with the men's undergrad cross-country team because there was no women's team. And she is speedy. In 1987, she won the Marine Corps Marathon in a time of 2.44.34, qualifying her for the 1988 Olympic Marathon Trials. After working at a law firm for more than a decade, she joined New York Roadrunners. In 2005, she was named president and CEO and race director of the New York City Marathon, making her the first female race director of a World Marathon Majors race and the first female leader of the world's premier road running organization. She is also former CEO of Virgin Sport and former president of EF Education First Pro Cycling Team. Mary, it's so great to have you here. Thanks. Elizabeth, it's so great to be here and I'm excited to talk with you. Great. You know, I want to start with basically what are we talking about? What is League One Volleyball? Oh, I'm so excited about this. Um, well, we are creating a professional league for players and fans that will allow the best American players to play at home and other athletes from around the world to make their mark with fans across the USA. I think what's really exciting is we're starting with a, a new approach, a new playbook by starting Community Up. We are starting with a nationwide, I should say growing nationwide network of competitive junior League One volleyball clubs throughout the U.S. as the foundation to this entire effort. And so it's incredibly powerful to 
get to start with these young athletes who are playing volleyball at all levels, including at a highly competitive level, and uh, deliver and service them. And then um, as, as time goes on here, launch a pro league that is desperately needed in the United States. Is there anything that we can compare this to just to give us reference? I think we're one of a kind. I think that we are a bit NBA, WNBA when it comes to the professional ranks and mixed together with the best junior grassroots programs. And maybe that's a good parallel to soccer in some ways. Together with a whole community vibe that um, is, is very much like a way of life brand. People who fall in love with volleyball play it, watch it, develop friendships that run quite deep in it. And, and it's a game you can play for life. So it's, it's got that lifestyle side to it as well. So analogies to parts of it, but unique on its own. And so what are you guys seeing as a relationship between the youth clubs, the junior clubs and the pro league eventually when that gets started? Well, you know, the beautiful thing is the youth game always is such a great grounding force of keeping you connected to what really matters, right? And yes, we care a lot about competition, but we care about the health and well-being of especially young women, um, but the young women and the young men in our clubs. And it keeps us grounded in the purpose, you know, helping these young players be their best selves in life, even beyond the game. And I think that's an approach that will very much take at the professional level as well. But the, the hope is that you know, wherever we start pro teams, that there'll be places where we already have youth teams and a real presence in, in a local community. You sort of hinted at a question I have is, why do you think that sports are so important? I did a bit of research before talking to you, obviously, and you know, sports has been important to you right from the get-go and not just doing sports, but you've wanted to be in the business of sports for a really long time. I was just on a phone call with one of my teammates and I was talking about this great New York Times piece that just ran a video piece that profiled young women from across the UK in talking about their teen years and talking about just actually what a challenging time it is in terms of a period of change in your life and whether you're more advanced than friends or less advanced and how much your body's changing and all the like, you don't realize that this is a moment in time and it's part of a beautiful journey. And this colleague said, he said, ah, I felt the same way growing up. And I said, do you know what really made a huge difference to me? And all the difference in the world was was playing sports, especially playing on team sports. Because as a kid in high school, my self-esteem was not rising and falling with every boyfriend or every, you know, any individual friend. It it was it was quite strong because it was anchored in part in family, but but very much in, in teams. And I just think sports can affect us all in different ways, but especially for young women and, and young men, it gives you a base, a foundation, and a chance to belong and be part of something, all of which is important in support, but also when we really get it right, it helps young people express themselves as individuals with the with the safety of of a of a community and a and a team as as a as a foundation. So it's pretty lofty stuff, but to me that was that's the kind of role sports played in my life. And I I want everybody to have the opportunity to have the benefits of sport in their life. Especially for women, you know, I always find that doing sports and especially in that time period that you're talking about when your body is changing so much, it gives you sort of what you're saying is a, a grounding in your body and how fantastic your body can be. And your mind and just yourself, especially again, if you're part of a team, you're part of a whole, everything's not rising and falling on you. But yeah, and it's so social and fun. And even if it gets competitive, there's all kinds of benefits to that. But it's always like the best teams I was watching the NCAA last night, the 
the final four for women's volleyball. And you can see in the most intense moments when there's a bit of looseness, when there's a bit of recognizing this is not the most important thing in the world, even though it feels like it right now, our best selves come out. And I think that's part of it. You're getting your best out of yourself physically, mentally, and then you're realizing um, the more you can have some fun with it, the more it helps you perform to be your best, both physically and mentally, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, certainly. You know, it was interesting in one of your earlier answers just now, you said that when you get it right, and I think that's pretty fascinating. So what are you guys doing to get it right? For you, what does that mean? I think it's on us as the leaders in sport to get it right. And whether we are the coaches, whether we're the management or leaders of a league or an organization, whether we're parents, like it's our job to provide perspective, to to find ways to help athletes who so desire to achieve at their very highest level. And I'd say help everybody achieve to their own personal highest level. To, to do it in a way that it's not only about one day or one hour or one medal or one meet, but but actually in a more holistic way that keeps in mind that hopefully they will have a long life with a healthy body and a healthy mind long after a highly competitive phase of life on a sports team. Who's running the junior teams? Who's coaching? Who's managing all that stuff? So in our case, and again, and this is all you know easier said than done, but I think it's vitally important and we are really fortunate to have a unified point of view on this at league one volleyball the overall coach of all coaches is a, a gentleman named jamie morrison he has worked with the u.s national team he was the head dutch national team coach for a while and as soon as i met jamie i was so enthusiastic about his approach because he very much has this bigger picture approach and i think it it's clear to me it runs through our club directors there's such a variety of ways people coach, but in general, it's trying to have this philosophy and approach of um, this is about their lives and, and we've got a responsibility to these athletes to, to get it as right as possible so that this is best summarized in, in a view around development. Whether they work with us as a club athlete or a pro athlete, we want them to leave us better and we want to be part of their progression to better. And that's a sport performance volleyball point of view and it's also a life point of view and you know, that's the kind of standard we want to hold ourselves to are you seeing the junior programs as a way to get i mean not obviously not for everybody but as a way to get into the pro league yeah it will definitely become part of the pipeline you know we'll be interested in top talent from across the country and and eventually across the world one of the big advantages of being part of a, a League One volleyball club is, is in some ways, really, it's a program of kind of path to pro. And, and what I like about it can be path to being a pro in your life. Um, but, but certainly for some, it'll be a path to being a pro volleyball player. And that's exciting for us to be able to offer some of the learning, some of the training, some of the experience that a pro has and, and bring it into a, a youth environment and teach it to a youth level. And will the pros, I mean, I think I read somewhere that the pros are gonna be involved with the junior teams in some way. Yeah, so already we have an ambassador program where some of the best women volleyball players in the US have already started going to some of our clubs and several are actually on our athletes council giving us feedback on the development of the pro league, but also you know chiming in on points of view on the youth side. And, and it's incredibly helpful. But yeah, I work with Danielle Scott. She works in a leads player relations and player development on our team. And she's a five-time Olympian. She was just at two of our junior clubs in Atlanta. And she's just such a natural. And it's such a big deal to these girls. And these girls, they don't remember Danielle Scott, but they know five-time Olympian. This is a this is a legend. To Carly Lloyd, who just had a baby. And she's in the San Francisco area. And so she's taken a break from her pro Italian team. And she's going to go to a club and Ronica Stone from Wisconsin. She was an Oregon volleyball player. She has already been to a Wisconsin club. And in each case, everyone loved it. Our, our focus was would the club players enjoy this and appreciate the experience. And of course, what's interesting is, yes, check the box. That seemed to be the case. But each of these players loved getting 
you know, in the club and, and getting to get closer to these girls and talk with them. And, you know, they're a different generation. So it's fun for them, too. I would have loved to have met a pro athlete when I was a kid. Well, we were just working on a little survey on this earlier column because we're saying, you know what? The beautiful thing is, yes, we can have them in the club. Yes, eventually they'll get to be seats in the arena watching. We can also, you know, today we can put them on a topic and, and put them on a Zoom call and see if that's interesting and have this mix of in real life, which I think is so powerful. And also sometimes, you know, you can actually hear and talk better when you're on a call too, believe it or not. So we'll have a nice mixture and, you know, we'll always be watching the balance. These are professional athletes and we can't run them ragged because we're looking out for their own development too. And I think there's plenty we're going to be able to do that benefit both the clubs and the pros. Um, so yeah, it's quite, it's quite fun. Well, Zoom certainly offers, as you mentioned, you know, you don't have to travel. Yeah, which they is a big deal. They can do it deal. from their closet. <laughs> especially, exactly. And, you know, half the time you're a pro athlete, and especially these women are so athletic, and the, you know, performances take a lot out of them. But you're hanging out, you know, as a pro athlete, you have time often. And so that makes it easier than going out and going to another thing. So I hope we get the mix right. But but as you said, and I know you were a cyclist and an athlete yourself, it can make such a difference. And it has for generations of boys. And now it's a couple of decades into it, but it's time that women have the same opportunity, but where you get to watch your favorite player and they toss you a ball at the beginning and suddenly you've got that on your, you know, in your bedroom and on your shelf for forever and you become a fan. So we love to develop the connection between pro and, and youth player. Yeah. So what are you taking from your work in cycling and in running to love? Oh, that's so interesting. I love this mix now of, of different sports. I think the most common denominator is the power of community in a sport in the mix of the grassroots player and the professional athlete. Because if you're purely a pro sport, you know, some of the biggest sports in the world that are, you know, best known for the pro athletes, that's great. But it's all the more compelling when not only are you connecting to fans, but you're connecting to players of different ages and abilities that aren't pros and may never, are never going to be pros. And cycling and running are very much known as participatory sports. And in both of those cases, they're more participatory than fan. Certainly in running, participatory is massive and fan is big around the biggest track meets and the biggest marathons. Cycling is huge. Again, it's both a part of what we do on a daily basis for many people. And then massive as a fan sport, especially in areas like Europe, but the participation base is you know, quite big. Volleyball is I think thought of more like a number of the big fan base sports like basketball and soccer and and football and the like but it's actually got a massive participatory base so it's the most participated in high school sport and still the fastest growing in the United States for girls huge participatory base 35 million you know former players in the US alone so I've really taken just the community side both running especially running and some of cycling do really well connecting the pro to the regular runner or rider. And that was a big focus for us at EF Pro Cycling too, with people like Lachlan Morton, who was amazing at inspiring the regular cyclists. So we have that same opportunity in volleyball is how do you help the pros inspire the quote unquote regular volleyball player? But what often goes unsaid is the reality in my experience from running and cycling is the the pro is ending up just as inspired by the recreational athlete. And there is just something so special about that relationship when one can appreciate the other. For people who are not really attuned to volleyball, you mentioned that it was one of the biggest sports for girls and it's fastest growing. So what is the attraction? What, what draws people to volleyball? So first, it's huge globally and already huge here and growing fast. As I said, the fastest growing and largest sport for high school girls in the U.S. And it's a thriving collegiate sport. So Title IX fueled volleyball in the United States. So we were coming up to the 50th anniversary in mid-June. When I think of a chief protagonist in the story of volleyball in the United States, 
Title IX is center stage. And then our U.S. Olympic team, we won all three beach, indoor, and sitting for a decade have had the national team, you know, right there, gold, silver, and bronze, the very top of the game globally. So it's a huge sport. And I want to mention something specific about it. And they'll tell you a little bit more about why people like it so much. But the big opportunity we have is to grow and build one of the rare, if not the only women first team sports in the United States and around the world, because this women's game is not defined by a men's game. The women's game is the, the best known expression of the sport in the USA and in some areas of the world. And so it doesn't start with everyone knowing the men's game and getting to know the women's game. It starts with the women's game. This is our moment. This is the chance for people to really, people are railing around sport and, and women's sport. And, and this sport is, uh, the women define it in many ways and lead it. So that's exciting. So I think people like that. I think people like how dynamic it is. It is a high scoring. It's like basketball. There's constantly points. It's like basketball in that you see the field of play and it's right in front of you and it's quite dynamic. And to me, it's the athleticism and the grace. Uh, again, watching last night, I was like, wow, it's like a dance when the team is is really moving well together with passes, right? And it's so it's this beautiful, you see the field of play, you see the relational aspect of that ball. It's, it's always going from one player to the next player, right? It's so fun to watch as a team sport and how they move as a team. And then I really appreciate the insane athleticism of these athletes on an, on an individual basis. So it's, it's fun and it's got a spirit that's very different than a lot of other sports. It's a pretty positive, uplifting spirit where after every point, there's a pause there and a coming together of the team. And that just leads to it being a pretty uplifting and fun experience to watch and cheer. I'm so glad you mentioned that it was a sort of a woman's first league. And I want to talk about that later, but are you going to be able to get games or more games, I should say, watchable on TV? Well, we're going to, one of the great opportunities is looking at camera angles and looking at the number of cameras and the like to really capture this game. It's one of those games, if you see the camera just high up, it's pretty cool to see the field of play, the full court, right? But you're not seeing the athleticism and the dynamic play and, and exchange among these athletes. So also getting cameras low and at the side is going to be really important. So how you capture what is a spectacular and beautiful game is going to be really important. What platforms we use is is definitely, again, a big opportunity because this game is one of those, like, it's in, in short clips, it's super compelling. And, you know, you want to see like the highlights and in the fun outtakes and the like from any given game and, and make that super accessible through social media and otherwise. But you also want to be on the biggest platforms. And over time, you know, where is that going to be? Is that our own um, OTT platform? Is that a mix of linear and in cable and OTT and in social? We'll see. But uh, we'll prioritize the experience of viewing the game and then keep growing the platforms on which you can see it and the formats on which you can catch it because not everybody's sitting down for a two hour game. And how do we give an opportunity to also get a taste of it and follow even if you're not sitting down for two hours? You know, as a sports lover and particularly as a women's sports lover, I find it frustrating because, you know, like all the NFL games, all the NBA games are on regular TV. You don't have to necessarily pay for it. But, you know, I'm paying for a cycling subscription. If I were following running yeah. more closely, I'd be paying for a running subscription. You know, cross-country skiing I follow. So, you know, like, how are you going to manage that? And this is certainly an issue with a lot of women's sports. Our job is certainly advocating. Uh, our job being the collective, people passionate about these sports. Um, and in our case, at League One Volleyball, we want to advocate for all of volleyball, right? Like we're in the middle of the equivalent of March Madness. It's incredibly compelling. You know what? Last weekend when we were at the level of still 64 teams, I'm scrolling, 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 scrolling through the ESPN app to get to volleyball, right? Well, how do we over time move that up? I'm really hopeful next week. Let's see what happens. Is Is mainstream media covering it? If not, okay, well, let's make sure we're 
you know, playing a role in making sure people know these compelling stories of these athletes and of the game. So I think we have to advocate all the time. We as leaders in the sport for well beyond our own, like this isn't just about League One Volleyball. We want people seeing women's volleyball from college through different pro initiatives. So I think that's really important. And you'll appreciate this. A big reason I'm here and in this role at League One Volleyball is in running, we had a lot of runway, no pun intended, to ensure the women were not only equal, but actually at the pro level, actually even boosted women beyond. So the profile, like in the marathon, we assured equal prize money. We we boosted the profile so that now you as well know women marathoners, often better than even men. I got to cycling and I, for the first time, experienced what many women's sports experience. <laughs> oh, well, we could have a race for the women, but nobody watches it. And of course, the answer is, well, yeah, I understand no one watches it because it's not on. I'm TV. shaking my so, head, you know that. <laughs> exactly. So, so it was eye-opening to me. I mean, that was only three years ago, right? I'm generalizing a little bit. It wasn't that no one watches it, or but I think... A sport like cycling was initially slow to recognize the fandom is is there if you show them these athletes and 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 give them a platform to the commercial opportunities and maybe the pace at which they become commercial opportunities is different in different areas of the world but certainly in the US, in the UK, in Central Europe, and hopefully more and more places around the world, there's a growing momentum around women's sports. And it started as a, a should support, and now it's want to support, right? It's starting, it's happening. But I think we all need to be really strong voices beyond whatever our given interest is to get better exposure and better opportunity for these sports because women's cycling, I, I think super compelling. And it's just people haven't had a chance. They're starting now, as you know. Women did really well last year, like for those who know European cycling, Tour Flanders and some of the other really big classics races, quite well received on television. And now women will get the first fully you know, staged Tour de France next year. And I expect it's gonna take off, uh, but it, it's it's overdue. Oh man, that that's just so full of stuff. Because as you know, I'm a cyclist. Um, one of the problems, in my experience, watching what's been going on in women's cycling, is that the people high up that are making these big decisions about what gets on TV, what races get scheduled, and all that stuff are all men. How are you guys combating that for volleyball, or is it needed to combat that? Well, it's interesting. I think first on cycling, I think where cycling's changing very, very fast at the highest level in the world tour is the teams. Like our team owner very much wanted a women's team. So we were going to figure out a way to do that. Even though our hands were full funding the men's team, we were going to figure out how to have a women's team too. And that's happening more and more. And, and there you get a mix of leaders. But when you get into a company in a sport like that, that the sponsor or private owners own the teams, it's, it's happening but an influence of women employees makes a difference in a company that's sponsoring a team or owning a team. And increasingly as women come through the ranks, but men who are responsible to women as their employees or otherwise, I think, you know, it's really starting to happen. And then the races and others begin to come around. In volleyball, it's the alpha expression. There's no W in love. We don't need to say it. We don't even position it as a women's sport. In fact, to us, it's League One Volleyball, and if we refer to a game, we'll refer to our games as volleyball, and and someday if we have men's, then that'll be men's volleyball. But women is, you know, it is the, for want of a better phrase, alpha expression of the game here. So it's, um, <laughs> because it's been that, because Total Nine's had a lot to do with that, there are a lot of men in high positions in the sport. There are way more male coaches in the college ranks than female. There are zero, if maybe a couple agents, I don't, I don't know any, that are women in, in volleyball. So the game, women's game has progressed and been profiled because 
it is the primary game and what most people follow, but there's still a need and opportunity to keep creating more opportunities for women in the ecosystem of volleyball, if that makes sense. But most U.S. volleyball players are going overseas. Is that correct right now? Today, there's no, there's no other option. So a quote that I love that another reporter said, she said, wait, this is like having the dream team without the NBA. Exactly. We have the best national team in the world and we don't have a league at home. So today we have thousands of young women playing division one, two, and three volleyball. And they are among the best in the world and they graduate and they want to play pro ball, just like an athlete that plays basketball or football or soccer. And they have nowhere to go, no way to play unless they live their career lives overseas. And that's, that's such a loss for these young women, and it's such a loss for U.S. fans. Um, and so it's such an exciting opportunity to create that opportunity to play full season. Like I like Athletes Unlimited, which is this uh, more like a festival style, like six week opportunity, but this opportunity to play full pro season play in the United States instead of going overseas is filling a giant need. It's so interesting that overseas are much more willing to adopt female athlete pro sports than we are here in the US? I think it depends on the sport. It's such a popular sport in college and I just think it hasn't had the investment and now we really are taking a fresh approach. Even in launching the pro league, we're taking a crawl, walk, run approach. The goal is not to have a flashy debut and we're the pro league and here we are and then not be here in 10 years. The goal is to create a sustainable league and start with our young future fans and start in markets where volleyball is a passion start with partners who want to support women and empowerment and be part of a fresh approach to sport and grow into 20 teams around the united states and and everything that that will be there when we become the next major sport in the u.s but we're we're willing to take this crawl, walk, run approach because we're so confident it's going to happen and, and want to give it its best chance to grow at every stage. So yeah, talk about the pro league and where you're at with that and yeah, maybe a timeline of what you're thinking about and what you're doing. Yeah. So I'm very much the voice of the athlete, you know, at the table of what's important to them and how do we think about this? And then the voice of the fan will begin to be important of, you know, how do we best show the very best of this game and, and, and draw people in. But where we are is very much doing the work around first, all of us supporting the club effort. Because if you think about it, the most important thing is that young player and her families, have they been serviced in volleyball? So we're interested in that. But as we start the pro, we're um, very much focused on college and then some of the very best high school players, because if we can begin to tell their stories, they are our future stars. I'm, I'm a big fan of um, overtime for men's basketball and what they've done with the young players. Like people follow the young player from a young age. And by the time they hit pro, you know, everyone knows the younger fan knows who they are. Our chance is to have our younger players grow up following these stars who aren't that far ahead of them in college, but very much in a phase of test and learn this year and basically around some unique experiences, probably one very much focused in college. And then on the content side and seeing what's most interesting. And then next year, I'm still working on it all, but we'll expand on that with multiple events and we can talk more about how that will play out. And then, you know, the following year, we're really you know getting into where we eventually end up, which will be with city name teams initially and then city based teams so city name teams city based teams and um we'll we'll progress there over the next few years with all the details to follow how do you imagine picking the cities great question uh one we really want to be in cities that are just dying to have their own pro volleyball team and two that support grassroots volleyball in in their markets and then three, it'll be great, you know, to be in in markets where if you get that first part where they really want to have a women's pro 
volleyball team, we're going to find partners who are excited about women as professionals and best in their sport. And then we're going to find partners who are excited about, you know, pro volleyball. You know, it's that alignment of where do people really want this? Because if you look at the best sports teams around the nation and the world, they have got, they are loved at home. So that's a big deal for us. What are the economics of having a U.S team, a city team, you know, because we want to keep the players here in the States rather than having them to play overseas. So what are the economics of that? Yeah, I think it's going to be important for us from the beginning to have this long run view so that we ensure the commercial sustainability for the league. And then we ensure for the players that they are paid right for their current play. And that we're also thinking about their development beyond their playing career. So, um, the economics are such that we will want to be competitive in play. At the same time, you know, find that right balance of ensuring we're hitting, um, hitting it right, so that we can keep the league going for for many years. Do you have a ballpark of what it would cost for me to have a team here? Just what would it cost to have a team? Um, I do, but we haven't yet talked a lot about that. So I'll say this. We're going to do this in a smart, efficient way, but but we need to invest. Like we need to invest to 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 do this right, and we'll be excited to partner in cities and towns where people want to invest in the in these athletes and ensure a, a fair pay in a, in a in a lifestyle that supports being a professional athlete and you know supports doing it right and having the right coaching and development resources around them. This isn't going to be on a shoestring. I do think getting it right and starting with athlete development is a really important starting point. And then we want to invest in the fan experiences as well. So it, uh, listen, you compare it to a men's investment and it's, um, it's going to look incredibly reasonable, but it's, it's going to be, we're looking for those people who want to invest with us in, in growing this really compelling game and sport. So you imagine that the athletes will be getting paid a reasonable amount for the entire year so that they're not having to find second jobs and all that. Yeah, we'll see. Again, we're taking this crawl, walk, run approach. So let's see how it all plays out. You know, there's there's scenarios on the way to fully being there that in these early years, there's an opportunity for them to also play, for example, with Athletes Unlimited. Maybe that's an opportunity. That's a six-week period, right? But what we're super mindful of and talking about a lot is what's the right amount to play and to compete? Like I don't think you ever want these athletes overstretched. You need to pay them and have them playing the right amount. So we'll see at what point it won't be too far in the future when they're you know, paid for full season and we have full seasons that are never going to be 52 weeks a year. They're going to be you know, a more classic season of, of say four months or so, and then you have all-star and and other games around that. But I think it's really important to get that balance right. And the goal is, is getting there. The path, um, the path may, may take, you know, a, a year or some period where they also play with another league for a bit. If so long as that's reasonable from a development perspective. Well, I mean, an athlete who is only playing for one season, is not, you know, sitting around on the couch watching Netflix and eating bonbons for the rest of the year. And they, you know, again, I don't want them to be running somewhere else looking for another job. Exactly. Well, and I think, you know, look at the NWSL and their campaign of no side hustle. That's exactly right. Like they have to be paid in a way that volleyball is their job because that's the level of athlete we're talking about. And so that's the way we look at it is ensuring that volleyball is their job. Now what's really unique in kind of cool about League One Volleyball is we're already a 365 day a year proposition in a good way in that as as we build the pro side and develop the pro season and series of games and events, we're also, we have this club side. So all year round, you know, these athletes will have an opportunity to engage in volleyball and in their parts of that, that can very much be part of, of what they do and, and part of their annual opportunity and commitment. I love books. One of my favorites from 2021 is not a sporty book, 
but just lovely and quiet. It's Suzanne and Gertrude, and available on our bookshop page, hearhersports.com slash bookshop. Whenever you buy books by linking to our main page, you help out the podcast, so thanks for your purchases. Oh, and Bookshop supports local bookstores, so you really get two awesome things at once. Plus, of course, the book delivered to your door. So let's talk a little bit about generally women's sports leagues in this country. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about how volleyball is going to come at it not copying a men's league. You know, it's going to be a league all on its own. So talk a little bit more about that and why you think that's so important. I think first, I think you always want to be looking through two lenses, the fan and the player, right? And who's it important to look out that way? The owners and the and the partners, the, you know, the people who are helping invest and helping fund to, to really say, okay, what's going to make this compelling for a fan? And fans change over time, right? Like how fans follow sports today is different. And how do we recognize that and feed that in? You know, I look at, this is getting deep into more of the, the business side, but if you look at elements, as I said, I like overtime for some of their content and highlights. I like fan controlled football for some of their fan elements that they get involved in. I like um, drone racing because of how compelling parts of that is like looking at like the different unique aspects of sport today that are resonating with different audiences and ours, especially the young women and the college fan super important and then very important from a player perspective like i think we're scratching the surface on the development of women volleyball players this is the biggest country with the best coaches and this opportunity to have them live at home in the united states and be able to both play for the national team if they're at you know that very highest level and play in a commercial league they are going to have an incredible opportunity if we do this right to develop as athletes and then for us to give them the chance to develop careers first they can come out of college where now we have nil and the opportunity to begin to develop your career you know around the game and and we're going to have opportunities you know as they progress in the game do they want to be a club director do they want to coach Do they want to work in marketing do they want to you know we can help them developed as full people beyond just the game from pretty early in this. So I think we're just looking at not what do we think they want, but in both cases, what is most important to the player and the different players at different ages and where is the fan and, and what do they want next? And there's been great work done by someone like Angela Ruggiero, a former Olympic hockey player around where is the fan today, right? It's this fluid fan that engages with sport in a variety of ways. So that's, the lens through which we're building something different. You know, you've mentioned a couple times about developing the person rather than simply the volleyball player. Does that mean that you are having people as part of love who will be like career coaches, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So part of what we'll do, and again, this is crawl, walk, run. So it's not all overnight, but definitely already from the youth side, it's the physical performance and also mental health. And we have some support around that in the mental side of the game as a step there. And then, as I mentioned, Danielle Scott, the five-time Olympian, she is our point person, but but part of the opportunity she and I and Jamie and the rest of our team have is talking to these athletes from the beginning. What parts of developing career do they want to know now? And again, at the table, we have athletes who are in their later stages of career. And so they, it's very fresh in their mind. What do they need? And also five and 10 years ago, what do they wish they had had? And then at the tables, like, you know, also I mentioned Veronica, they're straight out. So getting a sense from them, you know, what is important to you? So yes, from not from day one, because we have to grow into it all, but from pretty early on additional resources around career and personal development will be part of this. I know you're in crawl, walk, run stage, but have there been any surprises both, you know, around what's been easy to get done and what's been difficult for you guys? The surprise to me is how easy it is to get pro athlete feedback. It's like the athletes council or like partners, like there is invested, is this being successful? And that's something you feel 
really like with college and club, like directors, coaches, people really, they love this game. And so they want a pro full season league. And that's, that's awesome. I so much know that success is when you're really feeling a real need. It is a real problem. It's a real need. They, they, they're crying out for this, for this league. So that's, it's been a bit of a surprise how real that is. Like people in our ecosystem really want to see, see this, this pro league. So um, I would say that, and I would just say a pleasant surprise. These athletes are the best in the world and just really care and are open. And so that's been fun. And then I think the other thing I really love that I, somehow reminds me a lot about of running is these club directors they've dedicated their lives to this like they started 20 years ago when their son or their daughter was playing volleyball and they've built these these clubs and they're really committed about helping these young players progress and just be their best and that's that's the kind of stuff that's at the essence of the mission i want to talk a little bit about your own sporty life and you were a very active kid what do you remember from that time and the reason i'm asking is because you know you grew up in the 60s and 70s and it was at a time when you know women's sports was not what it is now and oftentimes there was not women's sports at all so i'm just curious what you remember from that time and i don't know lessons maybe i remember being a huge part of our lives i was the oldest of seven kids and was very lucky because my mom never had a chance to play, and she was a crazy sports fan. Like every Buffalo team, Sabres, back then Braves, um, Bills, of course. She loved sports. And then my dad coached all these different sports growing up. I guess really baseball was the thing he did most, not so much like basketball. But my sister and I were the first two of seven. And, you know, I always wonder, what if we weren't the first two? But we never sensed any gender discrimination at all from him. So we were playing ball from, from day one. And those were the days where, how did you spend your day? They just opened the door and we all went running out. And then every other family went running out and the street was full of playing street ball. Right. And, and that's the way I grew up really active. And also I was not good at all at any of the, the um, classic sports of the time or basketball and softball. Um, and, really wanted to be good at a sport. I didn't give enough credence to cheerleading and uh, gymnastics. Those were the areas that I was good. I was even a baton twirler, but those weren't at the time what I, what I held up in my mind of what I aspired to be good at. So I got so much out of that period because I actually was good at some things, but I actually wanted to be like you know, center court, I wanted to be playing. And I learned how to hustle like crazy. And, you know, being a hustler could get me third string on the basketball team or, or help me get on the track team by, by doing standing broad jump instead of like the 100 meter dash. So I got so much out of that period before I found the sports that um, really suited me as, as an athlete. But yeah, and I think the biggest thing, it was just fun. It wasn't all, it was life. And it's actually, Today, I run most mornings and it's actually not the running, it's, it's getting out with my buddies and being outside and having that fresh air. And, but again, it's my buddies and that's what I see in volleyball. Like these are people playing with their buddies and in that it's important in your early years. And then later when you're working and you're have kids and you're with or without kids, when you're working, like all of a sudden sport as part of how you feel good because it's physical and all that good stuff, but how you feel great mentally because it's social too, that's a big deal. And so I think sports actually been that for me from the earliest days. How do you see sports fitting into a kid's life? You know, I just wonder about a lot of these travel leagues, it just gets maybe too much. So how is love not going to get into that territory or are you even thinking about that? Yeah, no, our directors definitely think about this. And I do think there's something to the spirit of fun, the spirit of voice, especially the girls, it, you know, learning their own values through the game. And there's a lot of thinking about it because like you, I've worked with world-class athletes, right? And I did a lot of asking this around the parents of our cyclist. And you ask any parent of a pro athlete, the vast majority, how did the kid become a pro athlete? it's because the kid wanted to become a pro athlete. 
you cannot like push somebody into the highest levels of sport. You can encourage them. Like one of mine in third grade needed to be like, no, 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 <laughs> you can do this. Get on the court. And you know, he became like, he loves the game. So, so there are points in life in which where they really need to be encouraged, but the push and the pull, there's a balance to it. And, and there are phases like high school is an easy time to lose girls in sport. And I do think that that's a time where you're helping them hang in there, especially as their bodies are changing, especially as the way they felt last year is different than the way they feel this year. Like there's a keeping them in there, but it's keeping them in there in a way that's they got to be having some fun. They got to be like pumped up to be with their buddies. And it's got to be more than they're there because of the result in that game. And I think our, our sport directors are really mindful of that. Can you talk a little bit about maybe a perspective of women's sports? I mean, looking back again, because you've been involved so long, you know, being physically active yourself, but also in the business of sports for so long. And then also now that you're wanting to develop love, you know, what do you see in the future? Like, just talk about that sort of expanse of things and how women's sports has changed and is changing. I think um, the future, men and women love following a sport once they get to know it, especially when they grow up with it. And in the future, I, I really think we're going to talk about, in the U.S., we're going to talk about basketball and, and baseball and football and volleyball. Like, it's a big-time fan sport. But I also see it as, as a game that millions of girls can grow up playing and get a lot out of it. And I think that is true across a number of women's sports where in aggregate more and more and more it's already been happening right over these last few decades of of girls are going to get the opportunity to grow up as as an athlete of some form that benefits them later in life i think the different thing that's happening now is boys are following girls sports and women's sports and that's changing the fan game you know a lot of boys today who are basketball fans will know the top basketball players they'll be following like one of the stars got hurt this week and everybody knew that right and and you didn't know that 10 years ago or 20 years ago but I think through social media that's been an advantage in terms of helping boys and grow up with amazing women athletes and today they know them in sports like WNBA is certainly leading and the NWSL is is leading and, and full of opportunity so I think we're going to have this huge participatory base and we're going to have this really big fan base that will have grown up with these women's sports. And like, I think our, our league can be, you know, listed among the other top, you might say NBA and other top sports. And it won't matter that we're a women's game. That'll actually be a huge advantage. Not anything but that. And I think all of women's sports are headed in that direction. And I think in women's sports, we all want each other to do really well. I would argue, too, that boys who grow up following women's sports will be more able to have a woman boss at work. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I certainly hope so. And, you know, certainly this generation, you know, we were already more than majority college graduates that are women. And, you know, the pandemic was a pretty harsh reminder of how much work we have ahead to keep women in the workplace. But yeah, I think that's really interesting. And the respect is different, right? Like, you know, boys of decades ago grew up thinking they were they were the athletes and, and the women were something else. And guess what? Now boys today know they're both athletes if they so desire to be. And I think you're right. That could really translate into into better relations in the workplace and, you know, even better relations in, in general. What can fans do to support not just – volleyball but you know like all women's sports like what what can help watch buy a ticket yeah, yeah. like yeah. today so volleyball watch the college game go to the college game follow athletes unlimited follow these players like that's the beautiful thing today you can get on social media and you can follow these athletes and get to know these athletes but then do something buy their jersey you know go buy a ticket especially so these other sports that are up and going is professional sports in the u.s soccer basketball, softball is coming along. Definitely buy a ticket, buy a jersey. Yeah, like them in social media, but spend some money against women's sport. Does that really matter? Yeah, sure. Wait, why do you think it not matters? It totally matters. And, and you know, what, what matters is you want to show your fandom. 
and support the partners of the game, right? Like our partners will be great. When I say partners, I mean um, sponsors in this case. They're going to be great sponsors that fit with our brand. Um, I'm inspired right now by Angel City and in the NWSL, and they have taken very much a vision aligned, values aligned view with their partners. You know what? Birdies is one of their sponsors. This um, great, super comfortable shoe that feels like a slipper, but you can wear outside. Go buy a pair of birdies. Like, you know, support the people who are supporting women's sport because at the professional level, commercial sustainability is super important to keep these things going. So, so look out for the brands that are helping women's sport grow. Spend your money with the teams. Share your love of the game, you know, in an unabashed fashion with others. Those are all ways to support. You are very positive and optimistic, so I'm sure I can guess the answer to this question, but are you hopeful about the future of women's sports? And the reason I, I ask, because it, sometimes it feels like we're at the cusp of extraordinary changes, and then I get frustrated and, you know, like, here's some news. <laughs> Listen, the, it's it's true of any minority group today, right? Like, we have a lot of work left to do, and we will have that lot of work left to do for a long time. And there's always fits and starts. Like, let's look at the NWSL right now. Women's soccer is so compelling in the U.S. and in Europe. And the game is great. And the players are stars. And yet, the system was working against the athletes. And there was risk of abuse in it and the like. But what's going to happen is that feels like a step back. Hopefully, it's a huge step forward because there's a chance to address that and say, guess what? This isn't good enough. Like we need great coaches. We need support of athletes, not having them in compromised situations. So I think, you know, there's an example of this year might've felt like a step back. I, I hope so long as there's real action around it, it ends up catapulting that league forward and the, the players will be at the front of it. So, so there's an example of, you know, they're going to be periods where it doesn't feel like it's forward. But if we keep growing the foundation, even those steps back will lead to giant steps forward. So yeah, I'm positive and optimistic. And, and we got to like, let's have Billie Jean King front of mind every day. Like we got to keep working and there's there's still a long way to go. Um, but we're, we're on the road. Well, you're certainly doing the work and I appreciate it. And you've also been very generous with your time. So thank you very much. Well, so great to talk to you, and we'll have to go deeper on your sports someday. I want to hear more about, especially your cycling. Yeah. It's an exciting time in that sport, too. But we're excited, and I'm really lucky to work with an amazing team. And we have a great founding team and a great CEO and great sport directors and leaders and all kinds of good vibes around us. And um, I'm excited to be part of it all. Well, I'm excited to learn about it. So thanks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. And Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you for listening and following along with our stories of female athletes. You, the audience, make it worth the work we put into the show, so we appreciate you. As Mary mentioned, support those businesses and organizations supporting women's sports. That can be gear, tickets for games, subscriptions to streaming services. I love the WNBA streaming, and it's been $16 a year for a while. Or we'd love it if you support this very podcast. It really does help fund what we're doing and gives us a boost of smiles and confidence as we head into 2022. Hear Her Sports takes monthly donations through Patreon at patreon.com slash hearhersports. For $5 a month, you get access to special patron-only bonus audio content. Sometimes that means outtakes, and sometimes that means interviews done exclusively for you. Patreon may not be your thing. I totally get that. One-time donations are possible at hearhersports.com. We always have great shows coming up, so make sure to subscribe for free to Hear Her Sports on your favorite podcast player so you don't miss a thing. Until next time, bye-bye. Whether you are a brand new runner or you've been running for years, there is always a new way that running can change your life. And this is what the Planet Runner is all about. 
Being planted also means you're ready for growth. You can start exactly where you are right now and get better. I'm Coach Claire Bartholik, and I've coached hundreds of runners of all ages and abilities with science-backed training, nutrition, and mental strength techniques. And on the Planted Runner Podcast, I'll share it all with you. You can be a better runner at any age. I'll show you how.